stirring the motherfucking coffee with motherfucking chopsticks using the motherfucking vortex method. The only true motherfucking way to optimize the taste of your coffee. Good morning. Welcome to the Daybreak Show. I am Samuel L. Jackson. We'll get started, but first, coffee. Good. It's the coffee that I roasted over the weekend. It's magnificent. It's even better now, Tuesday. They said you could have your roasted coffee 12 hours after, so it has to release the gases. In the past, I heard, give it two days, give it 48 hours. And you know what? Roast it on Sunday, drink it on Tuesday. Give it, give it two days. Definitely 12 hours is not enough. There's more flavor in this than yesterday's coffee. Yesterday's coffee was good, but this is magnificent. Don't you just hate Facebook? I mean, I have come to despise Facebook. It's the first time ever where we started calling strangers friends and then getting unfriended. Well, we've been friends for uh, nine years. No, we haven't. We kind of connected on Facebook, but we never met. Some people I have met, and I'm really happy that I have. But I'm at the point now where I could like do without Facebook. The only problem is this. Here's a problem. I have a page called the George Bruno Experience that existed long before the Joe Rogan Experience existed. And I named it after the Jimi Hendrix album called the Jimi Hendrix Experience. That's what I named my Facebook page after. You can go check that out. It's a lot of the stuff that I talk about here and pictures and some extra things. And I used to uh, focus on uh, hair, barbering and styling and all that kind of stuff. And I think you have to have a regular Facebook page in order to have, like you have to have a personal page in order to have a page. If I could get rid of my regular Facebook and still keep the George Bruno experience, I think I would. I mean, I had the max. I had, what, 5,000 people at one time. Now I'm down to like 250. I've just been deleting and deleting and deleting. And it's not personal. Some are personal, but I really don't care. And I only, what I like about it is that a lot of my cousins, aunts and uncles are on there and it's nice to stay in touch with family. I wish it could all be much more private and not searchable, but somehow it is. You can't remain completely 100% private on Facebook, I don't believe. Because they take your data and your information and you waive your rights to everything and anything, pictures and whatever. The picture that you took of your breakfast yesterday morning is now the property of Facebook. Give your rights away when you click the terms of use with most apps. And Facebook has basically turned out to be evil. But here it's now like an evil stew mixed with some good things because now I can see what my European family had for dinner and whose birthday it is and see pictures of everybody of how they're aging in Europe and cousins and aunts and uncles. I do enjoy all that. I really do. I do enjoy seeing a handful of high school classmates from decades ago and some college mates. I do enjoy that. But overall, mm -mm, I don't like it. I don't like it at all. But they do pop up, quote unquote, memories from the past that are really interesting to see how your attitude or worldview has changed over the years. I think I got onto Facebook when it first came out in 2009, because every now and then I get a 2009 memory popping up. It's fascinating. But overall, I could do without it. How about you? Put your answer down below. I'd like to see that. I'm the kind of man who likes to get away, likes to start dreaming about tomorrow today. Never said that I loved you even though it's so. Where's that duffel bag of mine? It's time to go. The Marshall Tucker Band. 1977. Good song, isn't it? How's your picker doing? You know that thing that picks the opposite sex? That part of your brain that says... I want to go out with them, or I want to enter into a relationship with them. I remember I knew a woman many years ago, and you would know her if I said her name, but I won't. 
because of privacy purposes. I used to say names all the time. I'm not going to say her name. Married three times. Going to get married a fourth time. But not like a gold digger type. She was sicker. Sicker than that. She didn't like get richer or get a bigger house or get more every time she got married. She just like went back to being flop house hippie kind of girl. Nice girl. You would never know it if you just hung out with her. But I said, what's with the three husbands? And she says, uh, I have a bad picker. This is many years ago. This is probably 15 years ago, 16 years ago. I said, a picker, a bad picker, what's that? Because I'd never heard that word before. She goes, you know that part of you that like picks a person and says, let's get into a relationship with them. She says, that part of my heart or brain doesn't work well. She says, I have a bad picker. And I never heard that before. I've only heard a couple people say that since then. How is your picker doing? How do you choose people? Here's the danger of the red pill movement with men, is that they end up blaming other people rather than themselves. Are there some crappy people out there? Sure. Are there people out there that should not be in a relationship with anyone? Of course. Of course. Are there people climbing their way up the prosperity ladder through marriage? Hell yeah. I know plenty of women. I've dated plenty of women. I've dated hairdressers who have big, beautiful homes and land and great hobbies and nice cars and all kinds of great stuff, and they'd never be able to do it on a hairdresser's salary. I don't give a crap what anyone says. I know. I've been in the hair business. You don't make that kind of money unless you have a super successful salon and every chair is filled and every appointment is booked. And even then, it's a little bit iffy. But you do not get to that level without being married and then taking something when you leave the marriage. It's a fact. Be offended if you want. I don't care. But this woman did not take anything. She just literally packed the suitcase and left. Took a few pieces of artwork with her and that was it. A bad picker. A bad picker. How is your picker? Something we were never taught. You know, back in the days of arranged marriages, my grandparents, my maternal grandparents had an arranged marriage in Europe. That's where the parents did what they thought was best for their children in matchmaking. Some people say that's it's very Christian because it's like depending on God the Father to pair you up with a wife, but with the way marriages are fragile and there's a lot of divorce and a lot of broken, hurt, bloody bodies. Uh, mainly men, I will say that uh, what some think is God, is it really God? Or is it just what you think might have been God? Like, I've always said, you know, the angel that you marry is never the devil that you divorce. God brought her to me. I believe God brought us together. Ten years later, I'm sitting next to him in divorce court. He's crying. He's paying 2000 a month in alimony or more and another couple grand in, literally, I know a guy was paying 6000 a month in alimony. 6000 6000 a month. She was getting $72,000 a year. Hello. That guy was about to break. That's some rough stuff right there. And that's after the kids were grown and out of the house. That's not even paying child support. But there are men who are paying that. It's amazing. Men do take it rough because men do get the that stomach punch in court. They get it hard. Yeah. In addition to going from a father to being a visitor, seeing your kids every other weekend, and then your kids are strangers to you, and you're just kind of like uncle and not dad. 
and then stepdad, or the number of men that come in as potential stepdads, and then maybe a stepdad comes in eventually in the kids' lives. And you just have to suck it up. You have nothing to say about it. It's tough. I don't care what anyone says. It's tough. But I'm not going to go there. Here's the deal. Let's look at your picker from here moving forward. Let's not blame anyone. Let's not, let's not say, well, I must have been reading the tea leaves wrong, or I wasn't listening to God, or I was disobedient. Like, stop. Stop it already. Let's move forward with sanity, clarity, and reason. Does that mean not getting married? It might include not getting married. It might include getting married after you heal, after you get your crap together, after you fix your picker. My marriage broke up 17 years ago. It's a long time. But for a really long time, you couldn't even get me to think about marriage ever, ever again. And now that I'm open to it, I'm not rushing into anything, but I'm open to it. But here's the deal. Fix the picker. Fix the part of your brain that says, this is a good person. We will make a good couple. We're going to work together well. Leave your Johnson out of it. Leave the hormones out of it. That's part of it. But any can get along with any, all right? If this is what you're thinking about, then here's the deal. Use this head, not this head, men. Don't, some guys go in the other direction. We get along well, so they marry their best friend. And then basically it, it's a roommate that they have sex with a couple times a year. That won't be happening with me. And then it's the hot sex girl. And then you do that like crazy for a couple of years. And then you realize you really don't like each other. You get along well sexually. Like I said, any penis can get along with most vaginas. But that's not the basis for a marriage. You want to be together? Go for it. Just don't take it to the altar little different than yesterday's message about being open to marriage. But what do they say? It ain't bragging if you can do it. I've been single a long time. I've got the I've got the scars. I've got the experience. I've got the time behind me. And I'm not the same man. I'm different than I was decades ago. Much different. Vetting is so important, so important. I can't even tell you. Men get married and they sweep the red flags underneath the rug and then get, you know, they get married and part of my coaching is going to be a vetting service. Should you or shouldn't you move? There's guys who will spend more on a damn engagement ring than they will on exploring if they should marry this woman. They get so swept away by romanticism and start thinking more about a diamond ring than they do about their life for the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Pick her. Pick her. If you don't trust yourself, if you're a little shaky, don't let your hormones give you a false confidence. Talk to me after the first of the year. Put me on retainer and let's talk. I can save you from making another huge mistake or the first big mistake, but you have to listen to me. It's never been easier to fire your boss and do your own thing. If I had employees, I would lead them like a quarterback, not manage them like a herd of animals. I was thinking about what is the Super Bowl of Super Bowl ring of business. I have a friend who has a Super Bowl ring. He's a very famous coach. Very famous football coach. Everybody, wherever we hey, can I see your ring? People want to see his Super Bowl ring. It is very impressive. 
It's a big, heavy, solid gold ring. But what is the Super Bowl ring of business? What is it? Put your answer down below. What is the ultimate recognition that you are successful, that you wear, that you display for others to see? Put your answer down below. I'd love to see that. What's everybody doing for New Year's? What are you doing for New Year's Eve? I usually don't do much. I watch a movie. I guess if I was married, I might, might go out for dinner. Not into the, the partying, celebrating the partying, the, that kind of stuff. I'm usually up till maybe 10 or 11. Rarely am I up past midnight. I know in the neighborhood where I live, people bang pots and pans and let off fireworks. Do they do that where you are on New Year's? I could go to sleep at 10 o'clock, be sleeping for two hours, and all of a sudden at midnight, I hear people banging on pots and pans, and I hear fireworks. So then I thought to myself, why even go to sleep? Let, let's let them get through their fireworks and their pots and pans, and then I'll go to sleep. But then again, when you get up at 4 o'clock in the morning... So I don't know. i got to think about what I'm going to do this year. What are your New Year's plans? Put them down below. Do you watch TV? Do you watch a movie? Do you make a nice dinner? Do you crack open a bottle of wine? What do you do? Do you have a little house party? Those are things that I would like to do. Yeah. If it wasn't for incompetent managers and crappy companies, nobody would start a new business. Think about it. Sometimes a poorly run workplace is just the kick in the pants a person needs to spread their wings and do their own thing. A crappy workplace could be a little blessing in disguise. It can make you so sick and tired of the boss that you get out and start your own thing somehow, some way, somewhere. You know the joke where the guy says, uh, sees the boss pull up in a Corvette and says, wow, that is a nice car, the employee says to the boss, and the boss says, if you work hard, show up to work every day, be dedicated, give all you got, then I will be able to get a new one next year. There's nothing truer than that. Most of the time, the people you work for live better than you do, and there's a reason why. So that's why I talked about the crappy company. You heard me talk about this last week or the week before, this constructive discontent where you are so discontent where you work that you say, that's it, I'm done. I'm making a decision. I'm out of here. And you get your ducks in a row. You plan. You don't quit impulsively. You plan. You turn in your resignation. You thank them for your time. You don't tell them to take this job and shove it, although that is, I did that once and it is pretty satisfying. Everyone's got to do that at least once in their life. But you make a plan, and you get out of Dodge. And I'll never forget, it doesn't have to be at the same level of what you were making and what you were doing. It just has to be yours. That's what's most important. All right, so what's going on with this uh, vat? In getting a little bit irritating, isn't it? From the uh, pharma website, I'm not even going to say their name. No unprotected sex up to 28 days after the second dose due to reproductive safety risks. This is for males and females. Birth defects due to genetic manipulation. Great. That's from the pharma website. I'm not going to say their name. For the The Isn't that nice? No unprotected sex, because you could end up having reproductive issues. Good job. Good job. We can't have voter ID, but now they're talking about a vaccine ID to travel. Isn't that great? Why is that? Another bunch of hypocrisy and BS. It's like when I went to the dermatologist to just get my annual skin check. They wanted to see my insurance card and my driver's license. I said, why do you need my driver's license? They said, well, to make sure you are who you say you are. 
like, okay, that makes sense. Then I just started laughing and I thought, hmm, why don't we do that with voting to make sure you are who you say you are? Duh. But CNN said that you're going to need a vaccine ID if you want to travel. There's already a couple airlines that are doing it. Ready for revolution yet? What's up with the people that give you the elbow? Like when you see them or you know, you're, you're partying or you, you greet and they do this. I still shake hands. If someone gives me the elbow, I shake their elbow and make them feel like fucking idiots. Give me the fucking elbow. Get the hell out of here with your elbow bullshit. You don't care about saving lives. Shut the up, all right? I will go Samuel L. Jackson on you with that. For years, years, there were signs everywhere. Washing hands is the most important thing you can do to prevent spread of disease. So we washed our hands and everything was cool. It's still cool. It's still okay. It's gotten to the point where this is manipulation and control. It's got nothing to do with epidemiology. And with that, finish your coffee and I'll see you tomorrow on the Daybreak Show, your home of sanity, clarity, and reason. (laughs) 